uh, yes uh, i think ma'am I, i will present very shortly again uh, there is a uh, now the event is going live yeah so right. yeah uh, so once again i think uh, there were a few more participants by the time we went live and uh, once again i uh, heartily invite uh, dr navid kaur to this is shakti webinar series um, uh, dr navid kaur is a scientist at the central road research institute and uh, uh, she is uh, the prestigious holder of the dst award many uh, publications and uh, many uh, lecture series are to her uh, credit and we are very happy to have such an accomplished uh, speaker here so uh, let let us uh, start now without much uh, delay we look forward to your session ma'am thank you thank you uh, thank you thank you dr anil for this uh, brief introduction um well i'm really happy to be here to deliver this e lecture and i'm also excited because this is my first e lecture so uh, uh shall i start with the presentation i think uh, it's already 5 minutes yes you may yes you may so i'll uh, share my screen mm. so uh, is it visible it is visible to me maybe can we hear from one of the participants can you chat if it is visible clearly is the present okay thank you so much everybody i think ma'am they have confirmed that okay. they are able to see that okay okay so uh again i uh, welcome you all for this lecture i'm navid i'm working as a scientist in uh, csir crri so today i'll be talking about structural health monitoring that is the science behind the safety of structures right so i have deliberately kept this uh, presentation uh, assuming that there will be a mixed kind of audience so it is uh, it consists both of basics as well as its application in the field so i hope uh, by the end of this lecture you will be having some a sense of uh, health monitoring and how the sensors how the techniques uh, which techniques are used so i i, I assume by the end of this lecture you will be having some knowledge about it okay so uh, before we dive deep into the presentation let me first introduce you with the shm experts so uh, structural engineers they are the people who design and build the structures around us right electrical and electronics people they are responsible for building sensors which we see around us and data processing they are the people who have the capability of handling huge data right so the legends who have all these three um, expertise they are the shm experts so i uh, i relate structural health monitoring very closely with the human health monitoring for example if a person is sick what he'll do is go to a doctor and the doctor will run so many tests on the uh, sick person he'll use so many medical equipments to monitor the body parameters right So what are the body parameters here um bp sugar temperature and so many so the doctor will uh, analyze these parameters and based upon these parameters he will give a he will suggest some treatment right on the similar lines we have structural health monitoring say a structure got some damage because the structure cannot go to the expert but the shm expert will go to the structure and see use different kind of sensors and techniques and monitor the structural parameters now what are the structural parameters here deflection strain acceleration temperature corrosion right so these are the structural parameters which the expert will monitor 
and accordingly suggested treatment for the structure right so in this presentation we will be confining ourselves to uh, the sensors techniques and the different parameters we will not be talking about the treatment in this lecture okay <clears throat> so uh, we are fortunate that our human body is blessed with self healing capabilities however unfortunately not the structures you cannot expect the leaning tower of pisa to restore its position without human intervention isn't it so this again highlights the importance of shm experts so the agenda which will be following in, in this presentation will be first talking about what is health monitoring structural health monitoring and why it is important then we'll be talking about different kind of sensors which are used in shm the conventional sensors and the smart material based sensors then the techniques which are used in uh, uh, shm then what is the status of SS, shm after this we'll be covering the r and d work in the area of structural health monitoring specifically using the piezo transducers first then using the non contact type techniques including the radar interferometry technique uh, digital image correlation which we uh, frequently call dic then uh, we'll see what are the recent advances in structural health monitoring uh, we will uh, here cover the drone technology its integration with the artificial intelligence then smartphone enabled wireless etc and finally we'll uh, wrap up the presentation with the challenges which have blocked the shm which have not uh, made the shm to reach where it should have been till now okay. okay let's start so the formal definition of shm is estimating the state of the structural health and detecting the changes in it structure in the structure that can affect its performance so it has three components first is the condition monitoring here we assess the present condition of the structure so this is actually one time so on spot we assess the structure's condition so here we generally uh, see the concrete strength of the structure its integrity we measure the load carrying capacity so this is, basically this is one time and it is a sort of subset of the shm so it is one time then the structural monitoring is kind of long term so here we install sensors on the structure and keep on monitoring them for longer period of time so this is more of maintenance this is more inclined towards the maintenance to maintain the functional utility of the structure right and the third is structural control here we monitor the dynamic response of the structure uh using different uh, devices like um, friction dampers viscous dampers tube mass dampers um base isolators and so on so uh, the idea is um the uh, here i have taken the example of a uh, tube mass damper which is installed in the tapai 101 skyscraper in taiwan which was the tallest building till 2010 so just to give you a sense how big these um uh, structure uh, control mechanisms can be so this is the tube mass damper which is actually installed in that building so it is visible from the 88th floor of the building so there is actually a view gallery there you can see the tube mass damper so it is a big ball weighing around 660 tons it's a steel sphere ball so this a video is captured during the typhoon phoenix which happened in 2014 so you can imagine how big these control mechanisms sometimes can be so now the question is why do we need a system now uh, if a doctor commits a mistake it will cost only one life unfortunately but an engineer's mistake can cost it can be to so many lives as per a report by ncrb which was published in 2015 almost 8800 um lives has been um uh, deaths have been caused due to 117 bridge collapses so when a human life is associated with some time something it becomes really precious and it has to be well taken care of 
I have another example just to show you the importance of SHM. That's the Columbia Space Shuttle disaster, which happened in 2003. It happened, as per the NASA's report, it happened due to a small piece of foam from the uh, fuel tank. It hit the right left wing of the space shuttle. So we'll see this video um, to see the sequence of events. The shuttle was not equipped with any NDE system. So just based upon the computational analysis, the ground team gave uh, the go-ahead for the re-entry. So it shows that we really need NDT systems for the proper monitoring of the structures. So now we got the answer why we need SHM. So if you want to talk about structural safety, the answer is SHM. If you want to reduce the risk during the excavation, you should go for SHM. For avoiding the leakages in the pipe structures, it is required. Definitely, it's a replacement for the visual inspection, which can sometimes be very risky and even impossible in the inaccessible regions. For the retrofitting evaluation, this is uh, required. And finally, for the design validation, SHM is must. So unfortunately, even a car costing few lakhs is equipped with so many sensors. However, we civil engineers, we seldom bother to validate our designs after construction. OK, so now uh, we'll see the sensor technology. So here I have uh, considered a list of uh, conventional sensors and smart material based sensors. Conventional sensors, basically, they are the ones which are more frequently used in the uh, SHM um, of these structures. But uh, I'm sure the list is huge. Uh, not I mean, apart from the one which I have considered, there are so many sensors which are available in the market. But let me tell you one thing, that none of the sensor measure the structural parameters directly. However, they measure uh, some electrical quantities. For example, most of them measure voltage. So that voltage is actually calibrated to give you the structural parameters in the terms of strain, deflection, uh, temperature, corrosion, and so on. So all the so the most important thing here is the calibration constant. For example, if we take the example of electrical and vibrating bias strain, strain gauges, here the voltage is calibrated to give you the strain. So if I want to calibrate that output voltage to give me temperature, it's only the calibration constant which I have to change, right? So all the sensors, the most important thing is the calibration constant. Okay, so we'll take all of them one by one. First is electrical strain gauge. So you can see here, this consists of a small thin wire, which is moving around like this. So this, uh, it, it is a very fragile. It's very, um, in a very delicate sensor. So you attach, you just consider a beam, you attach this uh, strain gauges uh, on the bottom of the beam. For example, if the if you bend the beam, the length of this sensor of this wire will actually change. So as the length of this wire will change, its resistance will change. So that change in resistance is actually calibrated to give you the strain values, right? So that's the principle on which it works. The problem with these sensors is that they are very fragile. So uh, I don't prefer, I mean, I wouldn't uh, suggest you to use these kind of sensors for the field applications. However, they are um, in, uh, quite inexpensive and they are very uh, easily available. So they are actually most, um, um, prop, I mean, mostly used in the uh, for the strain measurements, the electrical strain gauges. Another type of sensor which is used for uh, strain measurement is the vibrating wire strain gauges. So they are actually very robust and they are very frequently used for uh, strain measurements in the site applications. So this is how it looks like. So this part, you can see the ends of this sensor. So this is attached to the structure. It, it is surface bonded. Even the embedded uh, vibrating wire strain gauges are also available in the market. So this, uh, for, again, you uh, attach this uh, vibrating wire strain gauge on the bottom of the beam. And uh, it consists of a, a very thin vibrating wire. You see, there is a vibrating wire here. So this wire actually runs from this point to this point. Okay. 
and for example when you energize this sensor there is a vibrating sensor when you energize it it will pluck this wire right this vibrating wire it will pluck it and this vibrating wire will start vibrating just like a rubber band okay so the frequency of this vibrating wire is actually calibrated for the strain measurements here now if if you say attach this vibrating uh, wire strain gauge at the bottom of the beam and the beam is deflected the length of the wire which is uh, uh, running from here to here that will change so its vibrating frequency will also change thus you can calculate the uh, strain in the terms of change in the frequency based using this uh, strain uh, strain gauge uh, i have already covered the pros and the cons yeah its problem is that this sensor can only be used for static strains not for the dynamic the previous one the uh, stray uh, uh, this one uh, electrolysis it can be used for the dynamic uh, measurements also but this cannot be used okay so next sensor is the linear variable differential transducer so we uh, very frequently call them lvdts these sensors are used for measuring the displacement the previous one were for the strain so they are used for measuring the displacement in the structures now they work on the principle of electromagnetic induction this is the same mechanism which is used for wireless mobile charging so i'm I, uh, i'm sure some of you might have heard about it so wireless uh, mobile charging let's see how it happens so in the charger there is a primary coil okay so this is the primary coil so when you give ac supply to the charger the electrons will start moving it around it and it start generating a electromagnetic flux so this is the primary coil generating the magnetic flux now if you bring your mobile phone uh, near this um, charger it also has your phone also has a similar smaller secondary coil so when you bring your charger uh, bring your phone near the charger a resultant flux will get generated in the secondary coil okay that causes the electrons to move in the coil and which results in the charging of your mobile phone so this is the electromagnetic induction its similar uh, similar uh, principle is uh, used in these uh, in the lvdt sensors so this is uh, how it looks like the sensor so this probe is actually attached to the structure for example you again consider a beam this probe the end of this probe will touch the <coughs> sorry will touch the bottom of the beam and it can move inside the sensor okay so if you cut the cross section of this sensor it will look something like this so it has uh, a primary coil the blue one is the primary coil and the red one are the two secondary coils they are identical they have the equal number of uh, turns so these wire these uh, coils are wrapped around the movable core so this probe is actually attached to a core inside it so this can move in this two way direction and to understand the principle this is how it will look like so you apply ac supply to the uh, primary winding so it will generate the magnetic flux since there are these are the two secondary windings so the resultant inducts will get generated in the secondary winding now when the uh, core is at the central position there is no differential electromotive force across these two uh secondary windings and when it moves in either of the direction a voltage will be generated due to differential emf across these uh, s1 and s2 secondary windings now that voltage is actually calibrated to give you the displacement in the structures next type is the load cell uh they are pretty simple so uh, the the very basic example of their application is in the weighing machines but this is the um, load cell which is actually used for the structural purpose here you can see it is used for measuring the pre stressing force in the psc girders which is so uh, it consists of two st uh, strain gauges 
so when you apply load on them the strain gauges will get deflected and they'll produce voltage and that voltage is calibrated for the load values next sensor is the thermocouple now this sensor is used for measuring the temperature in the structure most of the time it is embedded inside the structure and uh, usually we tie it around the uh, reinforcement so it works on the seebeck effect here in the seebeck effect what does it say that if there are two dissimilar metals two different metals are there and you connect their one end right and heat that joint end then the electrons will start moving towards the colder end since these are two different metals so there is a tendency that the speed of the electrons moving towards the colder end that will vary depending upon the conductivity of the two metals right so since the electrons which are reaching at the colder end they are different so there will be a voltage difference across this end so that voltage difference is calibrated to measure the temperature now can you tell me if the uh, if the these two uh, metals are in, instead of uh, different metals they are same what will be the output here yes you are right it will be zero volt because equal number of uh, electrons will be moving towards the colder end and there will be no voltage difference across this end so no voltage uh, uh, reading across this point and so we have to use two different metals another important point which i would like to make here is how they should be uh, uh, how these sensors should be embedded inside the structure for example again consider a beam so you have to make sure that the thermocouples are not inclined at any angle so they should be plane they should be residing in one plane so okay so they can move in their own plane but they cannot be inclined they cannot make they should not make actually any uh, angle with the horizontal this is because the temperature of the structure varies across the depth so if you are if you have uh, or maybe uh, by mistake it is kept like this then the results will be erroneous okay next sensor is the corrosion sensor so to understand the corrosion sensor first we have to understand corrosion and how it happens okay now uh, say say you consider any metal except the pure ones for example the gold all these metals they undergo lot of uh, machining process in the refineries to convert them into the form which they are actually uh, in which they can be actually used so during that uh, process huge amount of energy is infused in these metals so corrosion is nothing but taking that energy out from these metals to so that they can uh, attain their stable state so then they can come back to their natural state so corrosion is nothing but bringing that energy taking that energy out from the metal now how it happens considering any rcc structure so the as the ph of concrete is very high so that high ph results in a passive layer around the rebar so that stops the corrosion of the uh, rebar but when the concrete is uh, exposed to very harsh environment this uh, layer get uh, destroyed and the corrosion happens and how let me tell you how so uh, while uh, processing of the metal there are some regions in the metal which are having very high density of electrons and some are having low density of electrons right so the higher uh, density electrons that part of the uh, metal becomes the anode and the lower uh, lower density part uh, region becomes the cathode and of course there is a metallic path now for corrosion we know that we need four things anode cathode metallic path and an electrolyte now electrolyte is nothing but a fancy name for water right so when the concrete is in touch of water when there is water inside the concrete you got the electrolyte also otherwise anode cathode and metallic path was already there in the concrete structures so 
uh, when you got the electrolyte the ele uh, electrons will start transferring from the higher concentration towards the lower concentration and that results in the corrosion now again we have to uh, note one point here very important point that the corrosion always happen at the anode that is from where the electrons are leaving okay so always the corrosion happens at the anode so this is how the corrosion sensor looks like so it has different anodes you horizontal bars which you are seeing these are the anodes so this process is uh, called uh, cathodic protection what is happening here is so you apply an ex you provide an external anode in this uh, process you apply current to this anode and that results in uh, transferring the electrons through the electrolyte now i generally explain this process with an example you consider a small door okay from which only one or maximum two persons can go out then come out of that small door okay yeah. now in front of uh, that, that small door there is a huge big door from where thousands of people are coming in an opposite opposite direction right now that huge rush of people will have the tendency to block the one or two people who are coming from the small door you, you can can you uh, visualize that problem see so those two or three uh, one or two uh, people they cannot come out because the other people are coming in opposite direction the same thing we are doing here in the cathodic protection we are actually shifting the corrosion from the free bar to the external anode what is happening here is this anode is now a bigger door which i uh, gave you the example of so this anode will act as bigger door from where lot of electrons are coming because of ac supply so these electrons will transfer through the electrolyte to the cathode okay so we shifted the anode from here to here this is why so corrosion is not we have not stopped the corrosion we have shifted it from the rebar to the external anode so this is why we call this process as sacrificial anode cathodic protection so because the this anode is getting um, corroded during this process okay. okay accelerometers next sensor is accelerometers now i would say these are the most amazing sensors because they have revolutionized so many things around us you name any application it will it name any area it will have it application there right be it uh, measuring the acceleration due to gravity experienced by a spacecraft to measuring the speed of a car using your smartphone which is in your hand so it has its application in robotics construction industry aerospace gaming and the list is long so uh, even the um, inflating of the Uh, car bag, uh, this uh, air bags in your car. That is also happening because of accelerometers. So um, let us first revise our basics. Okay. So what is acceleration first? Now I'm sure all of you must be aware of its uh, definition that it is the change in velocity per unit time, right? Now uh, can you measure the acceleration of a car if you are sitting in it inside the car? which starts from a standstill condition yes you can it is very simple what you have to do is you have just have to see the speedometer of the car and use a stopwatch how for example the car starts from a standstill condition and attains a speed of 100 km per hour in 5 seconds right so the acceleration becomes 20 km per hour per second which means that in every second the car has attained a uh, uh, car has increased its speed by 20 km per second right now this is not the way how accelerometer measures the acceleration so it is rather based on the newton's second law of motion so it says if you can measure the amount of force required to move a unit mass Force is equal to mass into acceleration. Based upon that, 
then you can measure the acceleration. And uh, from this setup, from this spring mass configuration, we also know using the Hughes law that the force is equal to spring constant into the distance uh, displaced by this uh, spring. Now, if you use these two equations, you will get, you will reach here. And in this equation, if you can somehow measure the x value, the distance uh, traveled by the uh, displacement of the spring, rather, you can measure the acceleration because mass will be known and the spring constant will be known. So you just have to measure the displacement in the spring, then you can measure the acceleration. So based upon this philosophy, there are three different types of accelerometers, mechanical, capacitive, and piezoelectric accelerometers. So in uh, all of them uh, have a housing in which uh, there's a small proof mass and a small spring, and the mass is actually attached to the housing using a spring. So in the mechanical system, there is a pen attached to the proof mass, which will uh, leave traces on the paper when this accelerometer experiences any vibrational force. So this was actually used for the uh, seismometers for measuring the earthquakes. Second type is the capacitive uh, accelerometers. Here you have two capacitor plates. So when the uh, force, vibrational force is exerted on the accelerometer, these, uh, these, uh, the housing will uh, move and this result, this, uh, this proof mass will move and this will reduce the distance between the capacitor plates. So this will change the distance in the capacitor plates, which will change the capacitance of the plates. And that can be used to measure the distance and thus the acceleration. In the piezoelectric materials, there is a small piezoelectric uh, crystal attached to the proof mass. So when it experiences the force, external force, so it the ball secures, squeezes the piezoelectric material that causes a small uh, voltage that results in a small voltage. And uh, that voltage is, can be used to measure the uh, uh, deformation in the piezoelectric material and thus we can measure the based upon that deformation we can measure the acceleration okay so uh, the accelerometers which we have just seen they are quite bulky rather i would say the micro electromechanical system the mems based accelerometers they have actually changed the um, changed so many things around us so uh, these are the sensors, accelerometers, which are responsible for the screen rotation. You have your uh, uh, smartphones. So these are the, uh, the, uh, the the screen rotation in your uh, phone, smartphone is actually happening, happening due to these uh, MEMS accelerometers. So let's see how it is. So it is again having the same, um, same type of uh, fundamental uh, parts which we just saw in the previous accelerometer so there is a housing and this comb like structure is actually the proof mass right so it is by, by uh, vibrating like this so the flexibility of this mass is uh, giving you the spring parameter here spring component so if you zoom the three fingers so these are the green ones are the capacitor plates and as the proof mass is changing uh, vibrating in between this so it is causing change in the voltage. So that voltage is actually calibrated for measuring the acceleration. So in the conventional sensors, this is the last sensor, uh, tilt meter and inclinometer. So they are uh, used for measuring the angles with respect to the gravitational force. Now this is the tilt meter and uh, they work on the principle of uh, uh, plumb bob, which uh, I'm sure you all must have seen. So they have uh, these accelerometers embedded uh, inside them. So, uh, and these two detector plates. So if the, if there is any inclination, so the voltage across these detector plates will change that will be calibrated to give you the angle, right? So this it in uh, tilt meter, can be used actually for both the vertical as well as the horizontal inclination of the surface. However, the inclinometers, 
I'll show you this video. In the inclinometers are basically uh, only used for the vertical inclinations. Now they are used, uh, for example, if you consider the any well foundation which are uh, like uh, 20, 20 uh, to 30 meters deep. So you have to ensure the incline. Uh, if you have, you have to show ensure the verticality of this uh, um, deep foundation for for those uh, purposes. Inclinometer is used. So we'll see how it is uh, used. So actually, this is the sensor. So these are the balls. So this hole is the sensor. The 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 wheels are used to keep these uh, sensors in place. <coughs> Sorry. So this casing will be going throughout the well foundation. This yellow casing will go throughout the um, wall of the well foundation. So in this way, you will keep on uh, sending the sensor throughout the depth of the foundation. Once it touches the bottom, then you then uh, you will start taking its readings. And you keep on taking its reading. So for every time, you will make sure that the readings are same to ensure there is no angle inclination. Okay, okay so now we are done with the conventional sensors. Now, next is smart materials based sensors and actuators. So what are smart materials first? So these are the materials which have the ability to change their physical properties in a specific man ma manner when a specific type of stimulus is applied across them. Now, in, uh, till 1990s, the word smart and intelligent was uh, used interchangeably for these materials. But then uh, in 1988, during a workshop which was held in US uh, Army Research Office, it was decided that uh, the word intelligent is actually associated with a very high level cognitive skills. So the materials which are till now available, they they do not uh, match with that level. So it's not uh, correct to use the word um, intelligent. So then afterwards, it was uh, decided that only the word smart will be used for these materials. Right? Now, uh, if we are calling them smart, you can ask me, why are they smart? Okay, uh, You consider any material, and if you apply load on these materials, there is a tendency that the material will get deformed. Okay, so that mechanical deformation, uh, only the normal conventional materials, mechanical deformation will happen. However, in the smart materials, along with the mechanical deformations, there are some other effects. For example, uh, for the in the piezoelectric materials, along with the deformation, there is a charge generation as well. So. In these materials, there is always a coupling effect. Okay? So because of this, they are smart. Now, if you are calling them smart, they should all they should be uh, there must be a scale of smartness, isn't it? So the materials which are available till now, they generally are lying in the range of highly sensible to poorly intelligent level. So we'll take all the uh, smart materials one by one. First is piezoelectric materials. Now they have uh, these are the materials. When we apply mechanical stresses on them, then they will produce electrical charges like this. So when you compress them, charge will be generated across these materials. And when you apply electrical charge across these materials, they will get deformed. So you see, electrical charge is applied these across these materials, and they got and they got elongated. So um, next uh, is the smart uh, smart uh, memory alloys. These are the materials which regain their original shape when they are heated. Okay, so they have their they have a property that they regain their original shape. We'll uh, watch this video to understand how it's happening. So in the previous video, I showed how the nitinol remembers its original form when it's heated up. Now, many people were wondering if you could tie it in a knot and would it revert to its original shape? Let's give that a go. So I tried a various array of different knots and from what I've noticed, it kind of works. 
even though I couldn't get the knot as tight as I wanted because it's made for metal, it's still pretty impressive. This is uh, nothing but just the hot water. So he has uh, uh, the actual shape of this memory alloy is a pin. So whatever uh, shape you give this after deformation and you uh, put it in the hot water, it will regain its original shape of a pin. Okay, let's try something else. So here's a new batch of nitinol, which has some more wire around the top of a can and heated it to set a circular shape. And now, when I heat up this pathetic excuse for a triangle, it reverts back to a circular shape. Interesting. Now for this last test, it's just a bit of fun. I scrumpled up a big bunch of straight nitinol and threw it in a jar of hot water, just to see what would happen, really. Here we go. And it kind of looks like a spider's web. Okay, so uh, its applications are in um, biomedical field. So these uh, self-expanded stunts have been rigorously uh, these days used for uh, the surgery purposes. Then uh, these eyeglass frame, flexible uh, frames. And this is this space rover B. Now, um, the space which was the spacecraft which was used for the uh, the rover which was used for the uh, Columbia uh, this thing uh, I forgot the name of it. So um, these materials they have a very super elastic nature. That is why they can uh, withstand the um, damage due to very sharp uh, rocks. So. The NASA people now, they are trying to replace the wheels of the rover with this uh, smart, mem uh, smart material, uh, smart memory alloys. So next type is the electrorheological fluids. So they have the property that when electrical field is uh, applied across these uh, materials, their viscosity changes. So let's see how. So in this position, there is no uh, electric field applied currently I see uh, electric field is applied and its viscosity changed so it has its application in the dampers shock absorbers and these days in human prosthetics also Next type is the chromic uh, materials. So these uh, first is the thermochromic materials. So when these materials are exposed to uh, temperature, they change their color. In the photochromatic materials, they change their color when they are exposed to light. And the uh, electrochromic materials, these materials change their color when they are exposed to different voltages. Now, if you compare the properties of different smart materials, few of the smart materials that are rigorously used, first is the PZT, which is the piezoelectric material. This is another type of piezoelectric material only. And the magnetostrictive materials and smart memory alloys. Now, the free strain, which, uh, which is uh, there in the PZT materials, is uh, pretty good. So it is PPM is basically micro strain, so 1,000 micro strain. And uh, magneto stricter material, it is uh, 2000, but in SMA, it is uh, uh, 20,000. So, this makes SMA as a very good actuator. So, its application is uh, more in the actuation part. Uh, of course, the piezoelectric materials can, they also have a very good uh, um, free strain, so they also have the actuation uh, properties. And if we see the electro, uh, elastic modulus, all of them have comparable values except the PVDF because they are flexible materials. Then if you see the frequency band, now PZT materials, they can operate in very high uh, frequency band uh, as compared to the other materials. The SMS, they have very low frequency band, so definitely they cannot be used as sensors. So this is the reason why piezoelectric materials can be used both as actuators as well as sensors. So in this presentation, that is why we will be focusing only on the 
piezoelectric materials among all the smart materials which i have just till now covered now uh, piezoelectric materials they will, it is made up of two um, two words piezo and electricity piezo is a greek word which means to press so piezon which means to press and electricity means ember it means when you press these materials electricity will be produced right so how it happens now uh, for any crystalline material uh, if it is polycrystal then only it can be piezoelectric because in monocrystal all the uh, crystals will are having their are unidirectional however in the polycrystalline materials all the um, crystals are uh, directing in different directions so they have got stable in a way that there is no resultant charge so they are in stable condition in this in this uh, condition but uh, to make them to convert them into piezoelectric materials what you have to do is you have to apply a electric uh, charge and you have to heat them till the pure temperature what will happen the all the domains will start directing towards the electric field direction so, so even if you remove the heating then also they will remain in the same direction of the electric charge so this is its polarization direction right so this is how piezoelectric material is made now when you press these materials when you deform these materials electrical charge will be generated because these uh, these electricals will start uh, display uh, will start getting displaced from their position so that results in generation of charge okay so next is shm uh, techniques so in this presentation there i have given a huge list but we will be covering only the global technique and the local emi technique which are relevant to the um, piezoelectric materials so the main difference between the two is the two techniques is that in the global technique the whole structure is acting as one um, as a one structure and we apply uh, loads on it however in the local uh, emi technique only a small region is the uh, uh concentrated part where we uh, uh, where we monitor uh, the structure right so we'll take them one by one in the global technique uh, there is a structure and we apply dynamic loads in terms of impact or shakers but the load should be dynamic since it's a global dynamic technique so when you apply load on these uh, on the structure and then you compare the modal responses now what are modal responses they are the natural frequency of the structure and the mode shape of the structure so when you apply dynamic load on the structure they uh, we we the uh, different modal the modal responses will be compared in the damaged and the undamaged state so this technique is uh, used when the level of damage is high because the whole structure is acting as one unit and this technique is working in the frequency range of less than 100 hertz so only very uh, bigger level of damages can be detected using this technique next is the local emi technique in this technique we attach a piezoelectric patch to the structure and we uh, using this uh, machine lcr meter will um, give a voltage of we give we will give a, a sine wave voltage to the pzt patch which will cause the actuation in the pzt i told you pzt patch can act as both actuator as well as sensor now in the first stage when you have given the voltage sine wave uh, voltage to the pzt patch it will start actuating and it is acting as an actuator here and since the pzt patch is attached to the structure the surrounding structure will also start vibrating now in the second stage the same pzt patch will start acting as a sensor and it will sense the vibration of its surroundings and give the result in in the form of conductance and susceptance uh, so we'll see how they will look like uh, uh, important thing here another important thing which we have to see here is the frequency range in the previous uh, technique the frequency range was 100 hertz less than 100 hertz so it was 
uh, very low as compared to this because here you see the frequency range is 30 to 400 kilohertz so this is why since the frequency is very high it this technique is very sensitive to very small level of damages okay so uh, this is the uh, conductance typical conductance signature of a structure in the undamaged state and after damage it changes and this is how we will compare the two stages of the structure this is a relative technique uh, and uh, the previous the undamaged signature is just like the signature of a healthy body so if uh, like we have uh, for a, for a body we have different parameters which we, we know that this is the range for the temperature when you are when you are healthy and if it changes then we know there is some problem. So in the same way, if there is some problem, its healthy signature will get changed and we quantify the change of this uh, signature. Now, uh, since the last 20 to 25 years long, uh, back, it was just a research project, a research uh, topic. However, it has now converted into a huge industry. But uh, it has been uh, identified as a crucial element. However, there are no codal provisions for this, uh, for the SHM. No uh, detailed cost-benefit analysis are available that has uh, restricted its use. And also no certification is available for the SHM currently. So uh, now, till now, we have covered different type of sensors different SHM techniques and uh, different uh, uh, and its current status. Now uh, we will start covering the research work done in the field of structure health monitoring. First, we'll start with the uh, SHM uh, using the piezo transducers. So here uh, first is the integrated SHM and the energy harvesting. Now, as the uh, as for the uh, Prime Minister's vision of building 100 smart cities in the uh, next 10 years. So for any smart city, we need smart structures, right? Now, first is what are smart structures? So any structure which can communicate any unacceptable change in itself to the concerned authorities within a safe time, that's a smart structure. Now, the continuous monitoring of these uh, smart structures is important. For that, we, we might have to frequently change the batteries but sometimes it becomes really cumbersome and maybe impossible if the whole system is attached in an inaccessible region for that with our rigorous research we have developed a solution for this problem by using the dual nature of pzt patches because i told you the pzt patches they produce voltage when you apply when you apply strain on these materials so they have the energy harvesting properties as well. So using the energy harvesting and the structural health monitoring properties of the PZT patches, we have developed the self-sustainable system where the same PZT patch will be generating the energy as well as doing the health monitoring. So it can be used in several uh, places which are inaccessible. Let's understand the concept here of the integrated SHM and energy harvesting. Now say you consider any structure where you have attached a piezoelectric patch. For example, we consider a bridge over which some vehicles are moving. Now, because of the vehicle movement, there are mechanical vibrations in the bridge. Okay? So those mechanical vibrations will be uh, converted into electrical energy using the piezoelectric uh, material and uh, that electrical energy will be stored in some storing device this is all this is happening during the idle stage when no health monitoring is being done right now for say a damage has occurred in the structure then the same pzt patch will be used for the health monitoring of the structure by using the stored energy which was stored during the uh, energy harvesting stage right so uh, this is how uh, the uh, the concept of energy harvesting is. So energy harvesting plates are uh, planned to um, bond inside the road surface on which the vehicle load will be applied and the energy will be harvested. So some experiment 
which we have done in CRRI. So this is how the piezoelectric energy harvester plate was attached on the road surface and vehicle load was applied on it. Different type of loads were applied. A car which was weighing around one ton, then an SUV which was heavier than that, then a truck of around seven tons. Different vehicular speeds were used for the experiment. So these are the energy generated from the piezoelectric energy harvested plate. And this is this energy stored using this energy storing uh, circuit. So you can see here uh, the energy generated by the piezo uh, energy harvester was almost six to 24 times more than the energy stored. So, so we are currently working on improving the storage of the energy to uh, uh, store more uh, maximum uh, energy which we can. Next is the uh, structural health monitoring part using the piezo sensors. So here we know that there are a lot of uh, uh, post tensioning. Uh, there are a lot of losses in the PSC bridges, which happened uh, during the due course of uh, during the age of the PSC bridges. So uh, what we have done is we have attached sensors on these anchor blocks to monitor the residual post tensioning force in the bridges. So this is how the sensors were attached on the anchor block. And uh, this is the, uh, I'll just skip this. And these are the conductance signature during different stages of the um, post tensioning of the bridge. And we generated the calibration curves, which can be used for future um, estimation of the pre-stressing force. So now we covered the energy harvesting separately and the uh, 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 structural health monitoring using piezo patches separately. Now let's see how they can be integrated. This is uh, 85933 circuit, which is a very low power uh, consuming alternative for the conventional LCR meter. So we were using this LCR meter for doing our uh, uh, structural health monitoring using the piezo patch. So this is a very low power consuming alternative for this. So in whatever the uh, experiments which we did in the lab, they uh, from those experiments, we saw that for one time, if we are using this uh, circuit, for one time SHM using this circuit, we require 10 hours of charging, right? So energy harvesting time required is 10 hours. However, if we consider a Delhi Gurgaon Expressway uh, on which in one hour almost uh, 1348 vehicles are uh, moving in one hour. So the energy harvesting time will reduce from 10 hours to just 38 seconds. So if you attach these kind of uh, piezoelectric harvesting plates in these kind of uh, busy traffic uh, uh, road expressways, expressways, so energy harvesting time will drastically reduce. So next thing is uh, determination of in situ uh, early strength, concrete strength. Now, uh, it is important to know what is the best time to remove the formwork in the casting yards to increase their construction or production rate. For, uh, and also for the pre-stressing, uh, for the pre-stressing girders, it is important whether the concrete has reached its um, uh, perfect strength so that we can do the uh, pre-stressing. For that, uh, what we have done, we have given a solution uh, where we can measure the in-situ concrete strength, early in-situ concrete strength using the piezoelectric sensors. So we have embedded the sensors inside on, on site inside the concrete and we monitored the conductance signature of the piezoelectric patch. And uh, based upon that, we generated models and we estimated the concrete strength. And we found that uh, day two onwards, day two onwards, the results of the predicted strength and the actual strength were quite um, matching. They were encouraging. So next uh, was the post tensioning force uh, assessment in the PSC bridges. So in this experiment what we have done is we attached the piezoelectric patches on a conventional load cell so this is a load cell remember i showed you this its picture in uh, the conventional sensors so this is a con commercial load cells uh, load cell which costs uh, very expensive 
So what we have done, we attached piezoelectric patches on this uh, load cell and we calibrated the piezoelectric patch to give us the load value. Remember in the beginning, I told you that uh, you uh, any sensor will not give you the structural parameters. You have to calibrate it. As the commercial load cell is giving uh, the, uh, converting the strain to the load value in the same way, our piezo sensor is also not giving me the load value. I calibrated these uh, sensors to give me the load values. And uh, this is how uh, it was attached on the site. And we again calibrated as we calibrated in the lab and we compared the results with the commercial load cells. And except the one load cell, uh, rest of the three load cells were giving uh, good results. I mean, it's a very uh, low cost alternative uh, to the expensive load cells, I would say. So next is the retrofitting assessments using the piezo transducers. So in this experiment, what we did, we have uh, uh, given a deliberate damage in the beam. This is a four meter long RCC beam. So in this uh, beam, we, done, we have done uh, four level of damages and then we did the retrofitting. So for in the first level of damage, we removed the concrete. In the second level, we uh, um, uh, cut the first reinforcement and the second reinforcement. And then we welded the two in the retrofitting stage. And then we uh, put the concrete back and retrofitting in the retrofitting stage six. So we monitored the um, mode shape of the beam. So in the first stage, second damage stage, so it was uh, rising up because of reduction in the EI values and then it again reached back in the retrofitting stage toward uh, near its undamaged state. So next is the impact assessment using the piezo transducers. So in this experiment we used four different type of uh, sensors, piezoelectric sensors. Uh, first uh, uh, these were the circular sensors and the square sensors embedded in the cement mortar and a uh, adhesive layer. So this is how uh, they were, the sensors were instrumented in the slab. It was a one by one meter, three samples of slab were casted. And this is how the impact was applied on the slab using a steel ball. And this figure shows you the damage for after, uh, pictures of the uh, slab in after this uh, last impact seventh impact in which the material was lost so all the four sensors were uh, um, very successfully detecting the damage levels using the equivalent stiffness uh, um, derived using the piezoelectric patches piezoelectric sensors and next is fatigue monitoring using the piezoelectric sensors so in this experiment this the beauty of this experiment was that it was uh, uh, we did this experiment for continued it for almost one year. So we applied very uh, low level of strain using these um, uh, using a shaker, and uh, we monitored the uh, stiffness values derived from the piezoelectric patch using in this experiment, and it was given a well, uh, good sign S curve. Okay, so now we have finished the structural health monitoring using the piezo transducers. Next is uh, health monitoring using the non-contact techniques. So in this in this uh, non-contact techniques, we'll be first covering the radar interferometry technique. So here we were trying to measure the natural frequency of this pedestrian bridge, which is in front of the Okla NSIC uh, metro station in New Delhi. So this technique is based upon uh, this radar interferometry actually. So we kept the equipment. It is a non-contact type technique. As you can see, the, the we did not restrict the vehicle movement. And uh, we kept the um, uh, equipment in two locations. First, to measure the transverse uh, measurements, to do the transverse measurements, and then to do the longitudinal measurements. These are some of the typical results. And also, we compared these results with the conventional sensors. We attached the piezoelectric sensors on the bridge and the accelerometers. And we compared the results of this uh, um, radar interferometry with the uh, accelerometer and the piezoelectric sensors. 
and they were uh, the natural frequency was matching and then uh, this is a kind of preliminary work which we have done using the digital image correlation technique this technique is based on the calibration of the different frames of videos the problem actually with this technique is that uh, the data which we get is huge it's very heavy so it is a video based technique so we we have to capture the video of the whole beam during its destructive test so we attached uh, the conventional lvdts at the bottom of the beam and also we were capturing the video of the whole setup and uh, we actually what we do here is we calibrate for example this to this so we'll get the distance uh, from here to here we actually know the distance and then in the frame we will tell that uh, this uh, line corresponds to the actual distance between here to here so based upon that calibration uh, uh, in the video this uh, technique will give us the displacements which are happening in the beam so we compared the results of the lvdts and the dic technique so they were also uh, appreciably matching okay so next are the recent advances in the shm <coughs> so here uh, first we'll cover the drone technology we know that the um, uh, currently the practices which we are using are the rope access ladders and uh, maximum we are using the mobile bridge inspection units but they are many a times um, slow techniques and risky so drone technology is basically a um, a, a way which which has uh, revolutionized the uh, visual inspection till now i would say so uh, i think uh, we are short of time i will skip the videos i have very nice videos of the drone if time permits in the end and if uh, everybody agree i'll just show you these videos so these uh, the drones have been used to be used inside the box girders so this was the drone uh, uh, developed by elios uh, by a flyability company so i'll not cover I'll not, uh, this is another drone which can go very close to the structure so it is a l shaped uh, drone it can even crawl as well as uh, fly so this can measure the cracks uh, crack width as low as 0.1 mm so just quickly i'll show you as each wheel this is, is independent only zero exterior wall the wall we even able to now so next is the uh, drone where they people have uh, tried using the uh, contact type inspection so whatever drones i have till now shown you they were the replacement of the visual inspection so they are here they have tried doing the uh, upv i guess but there is not much of information available regarding this uh, drone so i'll just this is how you can see there is a arm going out so these are the upv probes This way, the, the drone will apply pressure and they take the UV reading. Okay. So next, uh, this is a drone which is used to build a rope bridge. This is a work done by uh, ETH Zurich. So I'll also play this video very quickly because we have already covered one hour, I guess. So in this way, I'll. Uh, quickly. So they are all computerized. Their movement is uh, all uh, planned. So this is how they are building the rope bridge. So it can take the load of a, a of a single person. This rope bridge, you can see. Okay. So in the uh, this is the uh, bridge where uh, in China where they have transported a two kilometer long uh, cable cable of the bridge cable for the bridge. So here you can see the drone is carrying a two kilometer long cable of the bridge. 
so i'll skip it close to this next is uh, the r and d work which we have done in crri we along with the our uh, industry partner we are developing a drone which can do both the visual inspection as well as the ndt where we include in ndt we include the rebound hammer and the upv the first phase which we have um, first phase we have completed so this is the bridge which we um, considered for our study first we collected the data using the drone high resolution geo referenced aerial pictures we took using the drone then we processed them in the uh, 3d software and then uh, 3d model were generated using that uh, software and uh, we compared the actual measurements with the measurements which we got from the model so this is actually the model and here we are measuring the uh, actual measurements of the bridge so we got an accuracy of 97% and we uh, like all other places also we were comparing the results so 97 to 100% of accuracy we got using the uh, uh, so this can be used for also for the um, for generating the drawings where of the old bridges where no drawings are available so we can use these 3d models for that also also for the visual inspection for example here water seepage restricted bearing action so we can use this 3d models for uh, the replacement of the visual inspection also then next in the next phase we have we are customizing this uh, drone for incorporating the entity techniques um, uh, the previous uh, results which i have shown you are for the uh, for an existing drone commercial drone which do not have any payload that is it cannot take any extra load however the customized drone which we have developed it has a payload of 600 grams now we are working on uh, attaching a rebound hammer replacement piezo based rebound hammer replacement which can be attached to this uh, um, drone for measuring the uh, concrete strength the next is uh, integrating the artificial intelligence with the drone technology. This I would show you quickly. So this actually works on the same principle like uh, on face recognition. So we will make the software learn that this is the width and this is the length of a particular crack. So next time when it uh, captures the picture of a similar crack, it will measure the length and its width. So this is the R&D work which is being done in Denmark. Okay, the last is the smartphone based enabled wireless structure health monitoring. Uh, well, uh, wireless health monitoring uh, is uh, definitely being used all around. Um, this is no more a research topic, but uh, 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 integrating it with the smartphone specifically for the piezo transducers that has not been done. So this is the kind of future work which we can explore. Okay, now what are the challenges? Finally, I'll wrap up it with the, the challenges which have not, uh, which are acting as a retaining force for uh, uh, restricting the SHM to reach where it should have reached not till now. Because these uh, structural health monitoring projects, actually they are long-term projects. So for uh, private uh, people, it becomes, many times it becomes uh, difficult to allocate resources for these kind of long-term uh, projects uh then we we get huge data like i told you shm expert needs to convert that huge data into useful information so that huge data you have you should have the capability of converting that data to a useful information which can only you just need alarming information okay this is the time uh, this is not uh, going in the right way now it requires some action then of course limited budgets but if you can uh, consider the life cycle cost of the structure, I would say this should not be uh, uh, considered as a challenge. Rather, it is the we should uh, we need to uh, make uh, people aware that uh, uh, long term life cycle cost of the structure is uh, much lower if you at, um, do the SHM of the structures than doing nothing. This is again a very big hindrance. Because many times people tend not doing anything rather than doing this complicated, the long time um, structure health monitoring processes. Then this is a um, sort of a political reason, I would say, because uh, uh, for example, fixing the potholes that has more visibility 
then doing structural health monitoring because uh, if you are doing structural health monitoring it has comparatively lesser visibility as such so people tend not to do shm rather they would uh, um, tend to fix the problems uh, for more visibility and finally people have the tendency to keep doing the things they were doing in past so they don't uh, the acceptance of the new technologies <clears throat> coming up is uh, rather uh, comparatively less so that has to be uh, changed so in the summary we have uh, learned about uh, different components of the structural health monitoring the condition monitoring structural monitoring and the structure control and uh, why it is important important and then uh, different sensor technologies for example for measuring the strain we have electrical and vibrating wire strain gauges for displacement we have lvdds and um, what is the reason for the screen rotation of your phone that's the accelerometer then we read uh, then we learned about piezoelectric materials and in electrological fluids they are the materials which change their velocity with electrical field shape memory alloys they change their shape when they are heated chromic materials they change their color with heat light and voltage then we um, learned about global technique and the local emi technique in the global technique the whole structure is acting as a one unit however in local emi technique only small part of the structure is responding then the current status of shm is that no certification is available and uh, we also uh, reviewed some of the research work done in shm and finally we did the uh, we learned about the challenges which are acting as a retaining force in the way of shm so in the end i would say lastly say that shm is an easy way to carry out your responsibility towards human life so we should practice it thank you very good presentation and as i see uh, madam from uh, so many messages from the participants i think uh, are you able to hear me excellent presentation madam hello hello yes uh, okay i hear you now can you hear me now yes ma'am yes ma'am yeah uh, we can take the yeah. questions ma'am so, so yes actually uh, i was just talking to you uh, first of all we all need to thank you it was really an amazing thank presentation it uh, we definitely need to connect more to people like you i think uh, shm is an opportunity we cannot get everywhere Uh, thanks a lot ma'am i think we have <laughs> lots uh, lots of questions and we are noting okay. them down uh, however i think we can take uh, two or three of yeah. them yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah so so one is uh, uh, do we use drone technology in india that's uh, the one that i read uh, what, what is it can you come again please do we uh, do we use drone technology in india by swapnali kulkarni Yes, yes. That's the one I just read. Uh, yeah. yeah, definitely. The research work which I showed you that is done by us in CRRI along with our uh, industry partner. So that we are currently doing in CSIR CRRI. So that work is in being done in India only. Right. Yeah, wonderful. 
uh, how do we measure ambient vibration so there are so many techniques for that so the traditional way of measuring the ambient vibration is uh, uh, the accelerometers and uh, the other what do you, uh, what do you, i'm sorry you asked the ambient vibrations yes ma'am that's the uh, question from the participant okay i started telling you about the vibrations as such uh, see ambient vibrations as such is uh, uh, if it is of that level that our sensors can sense it for example uh, many a times we have used uh, piezoelectric sensors for measuring the uh, vibrations caused by the wind but uh, if the wind speed is very low we cannot measure it so uh, we can use the very sensitive accelerometers and piezoelectric sensors uh, the dynamic uh, measurement sensors for measuring the uh, ambient vibrations if they are of a particular level which they can be measured no otherwise right that noise that becomes a noise actually that has to be filtered right. out yeah so uh, that's why i think uh, dr akshay das also has asked that how we manage to uh, how we manage the noise in the data so what technique you have used to manage the noise uh, um, generally in our uh, experiments actually as per my experience we first thing which we do is um, we reduce the noise at the source level itself for example I we see. try to use a electric connection which has a ups you always make sure that you do the measurements with the system where the uh, earthing is there right so this is the uh, okay. this is the cause actually um, when i was doing my research work in the iit delhi so almost like 6 months we were not able to see why we are not getting the data in the form which we want so ultimately then we came yeah. to know that it was uh, the noise problem and the uh, power which we were getting that was not uh, to the ups so i would suggest first thing you should make sure to stop the noise at the source itself then there are so many techniques to reduce the noise there are so many computational techniques actually where through which we can reduce the noise levels okay. and then um, um, Mr. Madhav wants to know which software you have used for the analysis. So I always have uh, used the Comsol software, C O M S O L. It's a very beautiful software uh, for specifically uh, for the piezoelectric sensors. So and very, uh, it's GUI uh, graphic user interface. It's very friendly. So if you practice a single problem, single example in it, you will be like a master. I would say. so i really recommend you using console software yeah um, mr gautam paul wants to know how much does shm cost for a typical building and how to approach the expert uh, is that something that is in your domain uh, well uh, cost estimation it uh, see uh, in yeah. the challenges in the last i told you that uh, shm it it is different for different structure that is another reason for uh, not being standard process for example in crri we are rigorously using the ndt techniques of rebound hammer upv etc because uh, they are still standard processes but if you are talking about uh, shm as such so that that totally depends upon the structure and what is what what we want what is the output which we want from the structure so depending upon that uh, we have to uh, we will be analyzing the cost but um, in a very short uh, sentence i would say for example for the bridges uh, the center point deflection the mid midpoint deflection of the bridge is very important so if you are not uh, attaching the whole huge sensors a set of sensors in the system you at least should uh, go for monitoring the center midpoint deflection of the structure so that i am sure that won't cost much so uh, the um, and if you compare the life cycle cost of the structure uh, because in case there is a problem in the structure and you have to go for the maintenance i am sure that will cost much much more in comparison to the shm cost which you will 
uh, be doing uh, in um, advance mm -hmm. to avoid that? I believe that's also a question of life cycle cost versus, uh, uh, you know, immediate. Uh, there are just last two questions that I'll be asking. The others we will note down and we may get back to you at your uh, uh, convenient mm -hmm. time. So one is, what is the energy harvested in one square meter area? Can we also stack up multiple piezoelectric modules for better efficiency over given area? Yes. Um, stacking has been uh, already explored by many researchers for the energy harvesting purpose. <coughs> but we uh, stacking definitely will increase the energy uh, output. But uh, we are currently actually not going for that uh, stacking part because uh, we are planning to use these sensors in, in the road surface. So I don't want to go for a solution for which we, I have to do a lot of mm. ground preparation. So what we are doing is we are going for horizontal laying of lot of sensors and we are putting all of them in parallel to improve the output. Right. Stacking will definitely improve the energy amount. Yes. And uh, one uh, last question we, we can take. Uh, who can look for career opportunities in SHM? How do one start after graduation? Graduation? Uh, I yeah. would suggest to go for uh, training programs. They are uh, in IIT also they are available in you can come to CRRI also. So we are uh, rigorously into SHM. So if you wish to start first, I would suggest go for some training or I'm sure that in your graduation program, there would be some two months, three months, and uh, there is a six month um, yeah. training course training program. Yeah. So you can first yeah. plan to go for that. And then if you like it, if you are enthusiastic about it, then uh, you should uh, plan for further research in it. But I'm sure uh, this is very challenging, actually, when you are going in the field, work, when you are doing it in the field. Yes, I believe uh, the theory of uh, communication and the reality, the reality, the work with the sensors, etc., is uh, quite uh, interesting and challenging. Uh, thank you so much, madam. We cannot thank you enough for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, yes, thank you, ma'am. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for the attendees also. Thanks a lot. Bye. Uh, yes, we had uh, almost 168 attendees. Right now we are having 106. Wow. But uh, we had almost 168 attendees. Yeah. So this, thank this you so much. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, and it was wonderful, absolutely. <laughs> I was also very excited about it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank okay. you so much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, ma'am.